So a little bit about the basic anatomy of the eye. So we know that the eye comprises of a tough outer wall. That outer wall is uh, transparent anteriorly and that part is called the cornea. And then it is opaque posteriorly and that part is called the sclera. The junction between them is called the limbus and the extraocular muscles are going to get attached to the sclera while the optic nerve is going to leave the globe posteriorly. Then inside to the outer wall, you have the middle layer and that is called the uvea. The uvea forms the choroid posteriorly and the ciliary body and the iris anteriorly. The ciliary body contains the smooth muscle and the contraction of the smooth muscle is going to allow the lens to assume a more globular shape and it is going to allow the lens to focus on near objects, okay? So when the ciliary body contracts, the zonules are going to get relaxed and that is going to allow for the accommodation. Uh, then you have the ciliary epithelium and the ciliary epithelium makes the aqueous humor and that is going to maintain the intraocular pressure. The ciliary body also provides attachment for the iris and that is going to form the pupillary diaphragm. Then the cornea anteriorly and the iris and the lens posteriorly, it forms the anterior chamber. And the periphery of this anterior chamber is called the iridocorneal angle. This angle is lined by a meshwork of cells and collagen beams and this is called the trabecular meshwork. Now through this trabecular meshwork the aqueous is going to drain into the Schlems canal and then into the venous system via the aqueous veins and this is the fundamental concept of uh, aqueous drainage. Now between the iris, lens and the ciliary body there is the posterior chamber okay so this is a very narrow space and then between the lens and the retina between the lens and the retina you have the vitreous body and this is called the posterior segment of the eye. Then we come to the conjunctiva. Now the conjunctiva over the globe this is going to be called the bulbar conjunctiva and, that is, and then it is going to move on and go into the fornices. Then it is going to reflect back from the posterior surface of the lids and there it is going to form the tarsal conjunctiva which is important for you to understand because this uh, tarsal conjunctiva is going to form a part of the posterior lamella of the eyelid. Then you have a connective tissue layer uh, that is called the tenon capsule and it is going to separate the conjunctiva from the sclera and it is prolonged backwards as a sheath around the rectus muscles. Then we come to the orbit. The eye lies within the bony orbit and this takes the shape of a four-sided pyramid. Inside the bony orbit you have the optic canal or the optic foramen that is going to allow the optic nerve to pass through. Then you have the superior and inferior orbital fissures. Now the superior and inferior orbital fissures are, is going to allow uh, the blood vessels and different cranial nerves to pass through it and which structures pass through which fissures we will discuss this in detail later on. Okay. Now the lacrimal gland occupies the superior lateral aspect of the orbit and then on the medial wall, the interior medial wall of the orbit, you have a fossa for the lacrimal sac. So this is the lacrimal fossa and this is going to house the lacrimal sac. Then we come to the eyelids. The eyelids offer mechanical protection to the globe. It spreads the tear film over the conjunctiva and cornea with each blink. It contains the meibomian oil glands that provides the lipid component of the tear film. And through closure and blinking, the eyelids prevent drying of the eyes. They also contain the puncta through which the tears flow into the lacrimal drainage system. Now we need to understand what is the concept of anterior and posterior lamella. So listen very carefully because this concept is going to form a foundation for you to understand a lot of the procedures that you will be learning in oculoplasty. Okay. So from outside to inside again, you have the skin, okay, then inside you have the muscle and then inside to the muscle you have the tarsal plate and then inside to the tarsal plate you have conjunctiva. So you have four structures, okay, skin, muscle, tarsal plate and conjunctiva, okay, skin, muscle, tarsal plate and conjunctiva. The skin and the muscle is going to form the anterior lamella, okay, the skin and muscle is going to make the anterior lamella and the tarsal plate and the conjunctiva is going to form the posterior lamella. So I already told you that when the bulbar conjunctiva goes on into the fornices and then it is reflected back from the posterior surface of the lid, it is going to form the tarsal conjunctiva. 
this conjunctiva along with the tarsal blade is going to form the posterior lamella. Then we come to the levator muscle. So the levator muscle along with the mulus muscle, it forms the elevators of the upper lid. So what are the upper lid elevators? You have the levator palpebris superioris and then you have the mulus muscle. The levator palpebris superioris is supplied by cranial nerve 3. So you can see the tendon of this muscle arises from the, the elevator palpebris superioris and then it attaches to the orbicularis oculi muscle. Again, the skin in the muscle forms a part of anterior lamina. Okay? And then the tarsal plate and the conjunctiva forms a part of the posterior lamina. So the tendon of the levator palpebris superioris attaches to the orbicularis oculi muscle. And this muscle is going to be responsible for the majority of the elevation that is going to take place in the lid. So majority of the lid elevation comes from the levator palpebris superioris. And then you have the mulus muscle. Now this muscle arises from the body of the levator palpebris superioris and then it attaches to the tarsal plate. Now this is important to understand because this mulus muscle provides 2 millimeters elevation of the upper lid and this muscle is supplied by the sympathetic nervous system. So if there is any pathology that compromises the sympathetic nervous system, if the sympathetic nervous system gets knocked off, then the mutus muscle function is going to be compromised and in that case you are going to see a slight tosis. For example in case of Horner syndrome in which the sympathetic nervous system gets knocked off and you see a slight tosis. So why is there a slight tosis? Because the levator palpebris superioris that gives the majority of the elevation of the upper lid that is intact in that case just the mutus muscle is compromised and mutus muscle provides just 2 millimeters elevation of the upper lid. Now another very important question for you to understand is that what are the structures that are analogous to the levator and mulus muscle in the lower lid. Now we know that the levator palpebris superioris and the mulus muscle is not present in the lower lid. So what are the synonymous structures to these two muscles in the lower lid? So they are the capsulopalpebral fascia and the inferior tarsal muscle. So what is the capsulopalpebral fascia? To understand this simply, this is basically a connective tissue sheath, a connective tissue structure that first surrounds the inferior oblique muscle and then it arises from the inferior oblique muscle and then it attaches to the skin. And then a muscle arises from this connective tissue sheath and this is called the inferior tarsal muscle. So the inferior tarsal muscle arises from the capsulopalpebral fascia and it attaches to the tarsus. The inferior tarsal muscle is a smooth muscle just like the modus muscle. And then we come to the lacrimal drainage system. So the tears, uh, we know that it drains into the puncta and then into the upper and lower canaliculus into the common canaliculus and then into the tear sac and then into the nasolacrimal duct. An important clinical point here is when you have a congenital nasolacrimal duct obstruction, that is due to the failure of canalization of the distal part of this nasolacrimal duct.